I think for me, it's important to understand what impact can I make where I am and make as great of an impact as what I possibly can with the opportunities that I'm giving. I think that's very important. And it's not about a title. It's not even necessarily about a leadership position that may be more powerful, but it's about doing the best I can with what I've got in that situation. And it's not about settling. It's not about complacency. It's about evaluating your situation. Mm -hmm. And where am I most needed? Patrick, sincere thanks, man. Yes, sir. Appreciate thanks for you, me. Uh, you know, taking the time, driving up here, and so I sincerely, to uh, sincerely appreciate it. If you would mind, would you go through just a little bit of background, what you do, you know, what makes up your day, kind of your current occupation, just a little bit of sort of that sort of thing for us to get us rolling? Certainly. So I'm a high school history teacher. I teach all levels of history. I teach advanced placement. I teach American History One, American History Two. And I teach it to students who are low-level learners as well as exceptional students, far brighter than I am. I also coach high school football. And I've been in this occupation 15 years. Um, I love it. I'm excited to wake up and go to work every day. Wow. Absolutely passionate about it. Love the kids, love the relationships. I teach in a small community. It's about 12,000 people in our community. We've got 1,258 students enrolled in our high school. And um, it's, it's a sense of family. It really is. And that's got its pros and its cons, but it's home more so than a job. So it sounds like uh, you were called and answered the call. I'm sure you had other right. options, other things you could have done. Right. Uh, we all know what they pay teachers, right. you know. So <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Sir. Well, honestly, so the way I stumbled into it is I was really inspired by my high school football coach. Okay. I grew up here in North Carolina, and he had such an impact on me. And um, individually and collectively on our whole team. Our team actually won a state championship my senior year in high school. So we had a lot of success. We had a lot of camaraderie. It was a great time to be in high school. I wanted to replicate that with my life. I wanted to do whatever I could, not necessarily to cling to that, but to allow others to have that same opportunity. I knew I wanted to coach football. Loved the sport, loved what it meant from one side to the other. But I wasn't positive, what could I do with my life that would allow me to do that as my job? So I said, let's give teaching a shot. So when I matriculated at Elon University, I enrolled in some teacher ed classes and honestly fell in love with it. Hmm. Um, history was something that I stumbled into. Uh, it's about people, it's about their stories, it's about their lives and how we can study them and apply it to our current situation to make it as good as it can be. So that's how I came to be a history teacher. So coming out of high school, you were... I knew. This is where I'm going, this is what I'm doing. And, and Right, we, we, and I hoped it worked out. Yeah. And yeah. really didn't have a plan otherwise. <laughs> I mean, you know, if it didn't, then we'll back up and punt and do what we yeah. need to do. Figure something different That's out. That's right. Now, I was going to ask you, you know, like, when was the first time in your life you really recognized leadership? Like, okay, this is... Right. This is what's going on. Was it your high school football coach I, or I before would, that? I, I would say it was the high school football coach. I was 14 years old, and I was actually late for the very first team meeting we had in June going into my freshman year. So technically, I'm not even in the high school yet. Yeah. I'm five minutes late for the 5.30 meeting because I had a dentist appointment. I arrived to the meeting. They had already started. I walk in, and he says, you need to sit outside. We've already started. So I'm sitting there outside of the classroom wondering, oh my gosh, what does this mean? For an hour, thinking. And afterward, he gives me a little lecture on being on time. I do some punishment runs when we start practice and we go out to the field and I'm a part of the team. That sense of accountability, that sense of what he was doing and what they were doing in that room was very important and needed me to be there, impacted me. Okay. And. Uh, holding me accountable, not hesitating one minute to, he didn't, he didn't care if he hurt my feelings. It was his program and this is the way that it was going to be. And, and punctuality was important. Honestly, as I've done some thinking, that was the first moment in true leadership that I, I noticed. And the impact it had on you, you did something, wasn't even intentional. That's right. Had no idea that you were impacting him or the team or yes, whatever sir. else was going on and all of a sudden intervention and then it's like 
this is somebody I take seriously. Yes, sir. I wasn't even aware of these other things. I'm assuming that never happened again. You know, you played never, for four years. Never, never, it never has. <laughs> played four years, yeah. Now, do you administer that same sort of thing today with your players in your classroom? How is that, is, is it different? I do. I, well, we call it setting the tone. Okay. And they always tell young teachers, you've got to set the tone. You have to have a groundwork, a, a framework of rules. You've got to adhere to those policies and rules and regulations as strictly as possible especially until you get to know the individuals. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have a system in place, then you have nothing in place. And that means people are gonna push you this way and push you that way. And so what are the core values of whatever, of your classroom, what are the core values of your team? One of the core values of my head coach's team was punctuality and accountability. And I learned that immediately. So for my students, my players initially, Day one, day two, if they make the same mistake, then they get the same result. However, as time goes on, you begin to understand the people that you're working with. And sometimes there's those extenuating circumstances and they need a little more understanding. But initially, you've, you, you've got to protect the integrity of what it is you're representing. Mm -hmm. I, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I would suggest, and I'm thinking about the whole idea of you showed up five minutes late and you had to do all these extra things. I always thought Lou Holtz made a career out of going to a bowl game, being a huge underdog, and just waiting for somebody to be 30 seconds late to a team breakfast, star player. Yes. And that player was benched. Yes, sir. Invariably, what happened in his career, somebody you never heard of stepped into that position. The whole thing was elevated. He yes, used sir. to take those kinds of sets of circumstances it almost got to the point where you, th you thought he was almost trying to orchestrate them. Maybe. But he would take yeah. those kind of circumstances and he would just say, this is a great way to get everybody that's okay right. to elevate, because nobody right. gives us a chance. And, and I, I would think a lot of coaches, that's, that's right. what you want, right? You that's want everybody right. to think, hey, we got no chance here. The minute the other team thinks, you know, this is just sort of a... That's an edge. That's when you have an edge. That's an edge. It sounds like you studied Lou Holtz a heck of a lot more than I have. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> His book, The Game Plan for Success, is, is phenomenal. And, and I, I'm fortunate enough in the, our small community to go and speak to different groups, whether it's elementary schools, middle schools, um, at events at our own school, and obviously in my classroom every day. I, I need to bring in as much wisdom as I can. Mm -hmm. I need to learn as much as I can from those people who've been there and have studied leadership and have studied success and what it takes to be successful. So I do. I read these books. Um, I admire Mike Krzyzewski and what he's been able to do at Duke University. Um, don't always agree with the way he coaches or some of the styles that he chooses to use, but I really believe in his mind what he's doing is exactly what his players need at that time. Yeah. I think he's, a, he's just masterful at that. And he writes about how he treats different players different ways based upon what their needs are. I try to do the same thing. As the kids get older, you know, um, once again, I'm dealing with kids typically under the age of 18. So, uh, one, Lou Holtz is one, there, there's many others, but Lou Holtz was phenomenal at, like you say, creating situations. He says something about momentum, and he thinks that momentum is a lot of baloney, okay? I don't totally agree with that, because you can almost feel momentum sometimes, right? And if you can almost <laughs> feel it, it's not baloney. Yeah. But here's what he says. He says, if you're losing going into a halftime, it's 14 to zero, and you score with 30 seconds left, now it's 14 to seven, half times happening, you're feeling pretty good about it. You may be losing, but you're feeling pretty good about it because you just did something special. Let's say the score is uh, seven to seven and the opponent scores just before halftime. What's the score? 14 to seven. Yeah. So why in one scenario are you all excited about it? In the other one, you're really kind of disheartened and down. The score is the same. So what's the difference? The way you approach it mentally. Mm -hmm. That's easy to say when you're not in that ball game and you're trying to you know compel those 60 70 kids to let's all do this it's okay because they all have their own notions but that's where the groundwork's got to be laid early on yeah yeah um but that made a lot of sense to me oh yeah and no, mathematically absolutely. you it's, can't it's a, you can't argue with the math there you can't argue with the math <laughs> that's one thing we're sure it's interesting there's example after example made of coaches the teachers you know that were very successful in eras gone by mm -hmm. that just flat out couldn't make it today. Like Vince Lombardi could not coach today. Right, right. You know, Bobby Knight would have a heck right. of a tough time, you know, Bear Bryant. That's right. Do you run up against sort of uh, cultural, generational challenges, pushback? Hey, wait a minute, you know? Like, 
I do. I think, too, as a society, obviously, we're different, and so coaching has to be different. We have evolved as a society, and we will continue to evolve. It's never-ending. So several years ago, I did a study on love languages. What are people's love languages? And there's five of them, and we don't have to go into details about what those five are, but how is it that people give and people receive love? In order to coach, you've got to understand how people receive love, because if you're going to show them love, and if you're gonna develop them and earn their trust, you've gotta know what language they speak. Some people do it through gifts, some people do it through words of kindness, some people do it through uh, physical affection, different types of love. So a high five to one kid may mean more than 100 words. For other kids, it may mean a positive note or encouragement in their locker or on their desk when they come into the classroom. And that's the way that you coach them. Yeah. That's the way that you get them to trust you so that you can take them to the places that they need to go. You can do it and do it comfortably. So that, lack of a better term, diagnostic process, what are you reading in those kids? And, and I'm sure there's not one thing, but right. just maybe give me one example. Like, what are you reading from somebody that leads you to believe, uh, I can do this, but I gotta shy away from this to establish what I want right. to establish. I think body language and simply observing them coming down the hall, observing them before practice starts and the whistle blows with their peers, watching how they interact with one another tells you a lot about who they are. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to talk to them. And then once you do begin to discuss and have dialogue with them, you fish a little bit. You see what makes them click. You throw some things out there and see how they respond to it. You ask certain questions and they're not preconceived questions, you just go with the flow of the conversation and get a feel for who they are as an individual. And then you've got to tap into that as their leader, as their coach. Okay, okay. So personalized, That's right. making mental notes, maybe even a couple of physical notes, but there's like exactly. this investigative process That's right. that, you're, That's you know, right. that you're going through. And I'll, and I'll add too, sorry to interrupt. I'll no, add no too, problem. You've got to be careful not to pigeonhole them into one particular area because the first or the second impression you have could change. Remember, I'm dealing with adolescents and, and teenagers and young adults. So as they change and their needs change and their hormones change, they change. As they learn more in school, as they learn more about you, as they learn more as a football player, their needs change. Mm -hmm. And it's critical that we're constantly evaluating them in a very formative way. Objective. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Trying to seek that. Yeah. What is the most frustrating thing about leading? You know, there's overwhelming positives and, and just a real sort of like a self-actualization that you get from doing what you do and, right. you know, thank you for that. Right. But what are the, what are the frustrations? What, what, what are some of the things associated with, oh boy, this is, I wish this thing would just go away. Yeah. Well, I, so we'll look at it in a couple of different ways. So yeah. for me, I'm not only leading students, I'm also leading coaches. And in leading coaches, one of the most frustrating things is I don't have the hiring or the firing power that a college coach would have or that a principal at a school would have. And sometimes, to be honest with you, we get stuck with coaches that aren't on the same page as us. Mm -hmm. That's very frustrating. They're not willing to make the sacrifice. They're not willing to put in the work. They maybe aren't willing to be focused. They haven't matured themselves as an individual. And so they find too much common ground with the kids and they enjoy being there instead of finding common ground and developing relationships, but also being the leader that they need to be at their very own position. You know, football is very much compartmentalized and we have these different positions, but we all have to be on the same page with the same end focus. And it, it's been a challenge for me to learn how to manage those coaches who aren't as invested as what I wish they would be. So they're, they're coaching for obviously different reasons than you were coaching for. Right. So where, where would they come from? Just, right. just for my own edification. So if you're not hiring them or saying, hey, listen, you've got some well, potential I want you to join, they're uh, forced on you somehow. So we haven't had a lot of staff turnover, but to be honest with you, so sometimes people don't end up being what they appear to be in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you make a poor choice in the hiring process. Right. Well, the way teaching is and the way the profession is, it's difficult. So they may be a great teacher in this particular subject and you thought they were gonna be a great coach. It just doesn't work out. Yeah. So you really have to do the best you can as a leader to make up for that deficiency. 
Mm -hmm. And what's wild is sometimes their very own players will make up for that deficiency because the player is more mature and the player gets more learning and more understanding than what that coach even does. And you hope that the coach will come around. So there's all types of professional development. You can have casual conversations and those will make things better. But remember, if they're not motivated in the beginning, will those things motivate them? And sometimes they mature and we'll see what happens. They mm -hmm. redirect their focus. With players, the most challenging thing is having them become great at time management. We require a lot out of our players, and, and I require as a teacher a lot out of my students. Time management is so very important, but I can't just tell them manage your time. I have to constantly remind them. So at the end of every practice, I'm telling them, the nine weeks, which is the end of our grading period, the nine weeks is ending in five weeks. Okay, we're almost halfway through. Make sure you're getting your work turned in. Make sure that we're far enough in now that if you need tutoring, you're getting it. Make sure these things, and then I'll follow up with that. So while I'm talking to the kids, I know who is struggling and who's not, and I'll make purposeful eye contact before I even have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So just helping them manage their time for academics, manage their time for athletics, manage their time for their social lives, or whatever it is that is going on. The older kids, a lot of them work. We had a young man, we had some 6 a.m. practices this past summer, try to beat the heat. He said he was gonna be late for practice. Why are you gonna be late? Start at 6 a.m., I mean, what could you be doing? I'm working third shift, unloading trucks at McDonald's. I don't get off till seven. Let's see if we can speak with your manager. Maybe you can go in an hour early, get off an hour early and just be a little bit late for practice. He's managing his time. Mm -hmm. He's got a real life situation he's dealing with. And he's not working third shifts because he's excited about it. He's working third shifts <laughs> because, didn't volunteer for because that he one. has to. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But he also wants to play football. And right. he also wants to maintain his 3.0 GPA. How can I help him do that? And mm -hmm. that's, that's challenging at, all, at times. Yeah. Because I got my own issues, right? My own time management things that I'm struggling with. Oh. But back to the service leadership, if I care, I'll make the sacrifices to do what I can to help him. Oh, yeah. How do you, as a coach, as a parent, as a teacher, handle success, treat it philosophically, and flip side of that coin, how do you handle failure? Yeah. The inevitable outcomes that uh, accompany any sort of a mission. So it's been a character flaw, to be honest, that I've become aware of over the last few years. Honestly, I handle success and I handle failure really the same way. What could I have done to be better? The problem is sometimes you don't stop and smell the roses and enjoy the victories along the way. As a head junior varsity coach, I've won 90% of the games that we've played in since 2005. As the varsity defensive coordinator, we've won 88% of the games we've been involved in since 2005. And that's really when I got started, which is why I date it back to that time. So we've had a lot of success. And it's not that you take them for granted, but it's that you're always looking to improve. How many missed tackles did we have? How many points did we give up? How many yards did we surrender? How many kids did I not have perform well on the state test? How many kids didn't get college credit for that AP exam? How many kids didn't graduate? Not necessarily how many kids did, how many kids didn't. Even if it's 100%, which is, I mean, it's never 100%. There's mm -hmm. always going to be room for improvement. And with a careful eye, I'm looking for that. However, I've learned that it's okay. Nick Saban uses it, he calls it the 24 hour rule. Mm -hmm. Take 24 hours and enjoy it or cry about it. Yeah. And after that, let's move on. Go. And yeah. I, I have tried to apply that to my own situation. Yeah. But it's yeah. tough because if you take 24 hours, you're going to look back and say, man, that's some time I could have used. Yeah, I could have figured that out. I could have done Especially when you're week to week, like with a game plan or whatever. When yeah. it's big picture, whole program stuff, 24 hours isn't so much. So yeah. there's that, and I don't know if that's a great answer or not, but success and failure I handle the same way, personal reflection. Yeah. How do you manage superstars? How do you lead superstars? People that are mm -hmm. really gifted, and, mm -hmm. and I suppose I would think more of that athletically than I might somebody that you would see in a history class or whatever, sure. but, but we're, we're- No, there's that too. Yeah, yeah, I know. But I mean, how do you handle, influence, lead kids that have special talent? Is yeah. it more of a challenge, less of a challenge? Well, it's the three rules. Do the right thing, make the most of what you've got, and, and love and respect others. And, and trying to just reiterate to them that this is who you need to become. You need to do the right thing. Just because you have this talent or this success doesn't 
give you a get out of jail free card. Mm -hmm. You need to make the most of it. So in the last couple of years, we've actually been fortunate enough to coach some All-State players and some All-Americans, which is an amazing thing. We've had every college imaginable coming through the, the halls of our school wanting to give these boys scholarships to play college football. Alabama, uh, Stanford. Uh, Greg Schiano and I talked for an hour two years ago. He was down from Ohio State. He had just taken the job as a defensive coordinator. And, um, and his name's in the hat for a lot of jobs right now. So these guys are coming in, and, and these kids get the big head. Mm -hmm. And they all put on Twitter, I'm pleased to announce I got my 21st offer. I'm blessed to announce I got my seventh, whatever it is. Yeah. You got to reel that in. You got to reel that in. And it's like, why are you doing this? What is motivating you right now? What did you want when you came in as a freshman? Why are you acting this way right now? Now, you got to be honest with them. And their parents need to be a part of that conversation because parents get caught up in that as well. Parents really get more caught up in it than players do. Oh, yeah. For whatever reason, whether it's vicarious living, whether it's just they're super proud, and every time they get an offer, they become more and more and more proud. You got you to gotta keep them focused on what's right there in the center, because if not, you'll create dissension within your team. So a coach shows up, you and I are sitting beside each other in class, and he wants to speak to you and not me. I'm really good, too. Why didn't he want to speak to me? Now, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I'm naturally jealous of you. That's not good. And so we don't shy away from it. We talk about it and we put it out there. Classroom's a little different. Yeah. It's different because in a classroom, what you do and what I do does not make a difference on how I score and how you score. Right. Football is very different. We need each other. We have to have each other. There's no way around it, period. Classroom's different. So I'm still working on the classroom part. I don't have any great answers for that. Sometimes I've had some Ivy League kids come along and they're arrogant, they're conceited. That is who they are. And no matter how hard I try to humble them at times, they're not going to be humbled. So we find other things that they're not necessarily good at, do some of those activities in class, and that encourages the other kids, whereas maybe it humbles them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's going to be great at everything. So if they're super great at articulating during a speech in class or they're really great at essay writing, let's do something that requires some artistic ability that maybe they're not quite as good at, but this kid over here who's not as good or not as articulate at giving a speech, they can have some success. So differentiated learning helps create more of an equal playing field. And plus, you're meeting the learning needs of all those different students. Yeah, and, and I would say, like, like I say, especially with really talented um, you know, kids or employees or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever else it is, that there is an aspect to um, providing circumstances that teach humility. Yes that sort of really, in many cases, can get them to embrace their talent that much more That's right. and drag some others with them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. do a lot of that in football, purposeful adversity. Right in the middle of practice, we'll stop and create a situation where these kids have to respond. Maybe we flip the script and we do conditioning at the start of practice instead of the end. So we just run them and run them and run them and run them. And then we'll go into a team period where they have to perform. Now play, yeah. And they're exhausted and they're tired and it's 90 degrees outside and borderline not able to do what it is we're asking them to do. And that's a different thing too. We've got to keep a beat on how they're feeling and how their health is, but pushing them to where when they are in that situation, they're going to be able to, uh, to excel. Yeah. I got to believe there are questions I didn't ask you that I should have. Hmm. What aspect of influencing other people in whatever realm of life, what did I miss? Right. I don't know. Um, for me, and I, I did some thinking driving in, for me personally, you know, I've been in the same job, essentially doing the same thing for the last 15 years. I've turned down six head coaching positions in that span of time. Because I feel like there's work to be done where I am. And you know, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. So I think for me, it's important to understand what impact can I make where I am and make as great of an impact as what I possibly can with the opportunities that I'm giving? I think that's very important. And it's not about a title. It's not even necessarily about a leadership position that may be more powerful, but it's about doing the best I can with what I've got in that situation. And it's not about settling. It's not about complacency. It's about evaluating your situation. Mm -hmm. And where am I most needed? 
And at this time in my life, this is where I'm most needed. And my family. And keeping oh, yeah. continuity and stability in my family is a big part of that. They're very involved in the community. If I didn't have that family, thank God I do. But if I didn't, probably would have taken some other opportunities. But in the meantime, instead of looking at the jobs I don't have, let me do the best job I can with the one I've got. Yep. And the rest of it will take care of itself later on. Because there's room for me to grow right here. Yeah. I heard Mr. Goldsmith say in a video I watched that the older he gets, the less aspiring he becomes, but the greater impact he has. Yeah, very true. I could 1,000% agree with that. Well, and that's okay. I will tell you this. I just got to say, if there were more people like you, there'd be less problems in the world. Well, thank you. And I mean that, and I just want to say sincere thanks. Oh, thank you. On behalf of everybody at the Center for Leadership Studies for taking time to share your thoughts. Thanks for having me.